again with a perspective on what's going on in Pennsylvania, a state where energy has been a big issue, the whole question of fracking, what it's done for the Pennsylvania economy, the opportunities there, and yet a state also facing budget challenges with pension uh, liability questions and a host of other policy questions that will inform our conversation. And uh, Governor, welcome. Juliana, welcome. It's all yours. We'll switch. Okay, we'll switch. <laughs> Musical chairs. We've got to have the TV cameras lined up just right. Uh, if anyone calls, you can answer my phone. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you so much for, oh, thank you for joining us. This is a conversation on the state of the Keystone State, so budgets, pensions, and energy. Let's start right off um, with the budget. Uh, Governor, you proposed a $28.4 billion budget back in February has to be passed by June 30th, but funding is contingent on, all, on passage of changes to the state's pension system. Right. You've called a, this a pension crisis. Give us, put in perspective how deep the hole is. Well, the, the, the hole is very deep, and it's not just in Pennsylvania. If you look at Illinois, you look at California, you, you uh, look at other states, are, they're facing the same thing. Uh, in Pennsylvania right now, we are about $41, $42 billion underfunded. Uh, yeah, I heard the Oz out there. Uh, decisions that were made over the last uh, 10 years of um, not funding enough, uh, making some changes to the benefit of recipients uh, to the two pension systems at the state level, that would be the state employees and the, the teachers of, of Pennsylvania. Um, and then changes in the formula uh, to that. And then an underperforming market has caused uh, the uh, state system to be $42 billion, uh, underfunded. We have a recovery that we're going through. We have to continue to put money into the pension system. And right now, we're on pace to uh, average about 62% of all new revenue each year coming in to uh, yeah, the general fund going into the budget. But some of these changes you proposed are not without controversy because they affect... Uh, for example, it changes ben pension benefits for current employees. Well, they do. Well, first off, because this is televised and somebody back in Pennsylvania is watching this, and we have a lot of retired people in Pennsylvania, it does not affect any of the retirees at all. But current. Um, but current employees, it would not affect what they have accrued to date. Um, there was a multiplier number that was changed in 2001. We want to change it back to where it was in 2001. Uh, in 2001, when they changed it, uh, they made it retroactive, so from their date of service, if they went into service in 1981, they got a benefit of the, that they hadn't uh, actually earned at that point in time going forward. We don't want to take what they've earned away, but we do want to go forward and say we've got to go back to uh, by half a percent uh, to 2.0. With the legislature, it would be from 3 to 2.5. Um, that will be the subject of litigation. And as we know, every time you make changes, there's going to be litigation under our Constitution as to whether you can make a change like that. Um, first off, it has to get through the legislature, so that will be an issue. But we're also looking at some of the provisions that New York State did, anti-spiking provisions when it comes to overtime that you can't uh, raise through overtime what your uh, salary was in the last three years. We're going to spread the uh, period uh, to look at uh, the average for your pension to five years rather than three years. So there's some other changes in there that uh, we feel would be constitutional also. Some of the ratings agencies have, all, have also done analyses of, of the proposals, and, and they're still even threatening downgrades in the next couple of years. Well, and that's we, we continue to work with the legislature. We um, want to see uh, what kind of willingness we have in the legislature to make changes. I think there is. When I proposed uh, that in February in my budget address, it, the room was pretty quiet because it literally affects the room also uh, w with the entire legislature and the judiciary. But as you start looking at the fact that 62 percent of all new revenue every year is going into uh, pension increases. Uh, for instance, this year we have uh, 1.6 of a $27.6 billion budget going into pension payments. By the year 1617, it'll be $4.3 billion going into the uh, budget. And we do not see the budget growing that fast. So you see it's going to continue to take more and more of the, of the uh, general fund budget and really become more of a pension fund budget. Uh, well, also, your budget, it, it calls for getting the state out of the liquor business. 
right? Well, actually, we're not counting on that in the budget. The, okay. the, the, the separate bill is to uh, end the monopoly that the state presently has when it comes to selling wine and liquor in, in Pennsylvania. Right now, we control the wholesale uh, and the uh, retail uh, portion of that. It's only two states left, It's two right? states, uh, us and Utah. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and other states have variations of that, um, but ours are the uh, most restrictive. Uh, Governor Ridge and Governor Thornburg, when they were both governors, they attempted to uh, get us out of the business. Uh, we have introduced legislation. It has passed the House, first time it's ever passed the House. <laughs> It's in the Senate, and literally as we speak today, there is a one of three hearings that uh, the Senate is having on whether we would be able to do this. There's questions as to the uh, whether it would be revenue neutral because we do take that money uh, that we receive there into um, the, the general fund in addition to uh, the retail tax that we would get. Uh, but in my opinion, we need to get Pennsylvania out of the business of selling wine and, and liquor. Um, we have already privatized the beer industry for many, many years, uh, and that is probably the biggest hang-up on this. There's union opposition from the uh, clerks in the retail stores, but there is um, some opposition. We're trying to uh, deal with the opposition you know, and, and, and meet their needs with the beer distributors of Pennsylvania where you have to go to buy a case of beer. We're kind of archaic. If you want a six-pack, you go to a bar. If you want a case, you go to a beer distributor. If you want to go into a grocery store, you have to, it has to be a certain grocery store that you can get a, a six-pack of beer. And I see the heads and the smiles all shaking like you guys that's are crazy <laughs> in Pennsylvania. Yes, we are, and that's what we're trying to fix. Well, would you be open um, to some sort of hybrid kind of deal where there's you know, liquor stores are owned by the state, but uh, private licenses to sell wine and spirits? Well, in fact, the bill that we have right now that's gone over to um, the, the Senate was not exactly the bill that I introduced. And it does call for a slow phase out of having the liquor stores still exist, but having wine and spirits going in, into the private sector also. And then at a certain point, um, if those wine and spirit stores uh, can't compete, mm -hmm. we would close those stores. Mm -hmm. So that's in the mix at the moment. Mm -hmm. The one thing I've learned, <coughs> excuse me, as governor now, is that whatever we introduce at the beginning is not nearly what comes out at the end. It goes through that sausage grinder, uh, what laws are. And so we will see. But the goal is to have it, a bill on my desk by June the 30th. Okay. Well, sticking... Uh, with the budget, if the economy in Pennsylvania is improving, if the budget has been steadily recovering over the last couple of years, um, how much of the higher education funding will you be able to restore? Well, in fact, this year we are flatlining the higher education funding. Um, we had agreement from the state system of higher education, that's 14 um, schools, uh, Division two level schools is the easy, probably the easiest way to uh, explain the schools across Pennsylvania, totally owned by the state. Our state related are well known: Penn State, Pitt, Temple, and then uh, Lincoln University. They receive aid from the state. Uh, two years ago, I had to reduce the budget. Uh, in fact, I reduced the budget almost two billion dollars because we just did not have the money, and I wasn't going to increase taxes. We had taken federal stimulus money and supplanted it into our budget, and that money, as you know, stopped coming from Washington and, and it wasn't there. A lot of that went to education. In our budget right now, 40% of the, of the budget of Pennsylvania goes to education, K through 12, and higher ed. Difficult times the last two years, but going into this budget cycle, we talked with the state system, we talked with uh, the state related about um, taking uh, a flat line, they get exactly what they got last year, with, their, with the idea that they need to control their costs because we were observing that their costs continue to go up at a, uh, especially with some of the universities, a dramatic effect. And as we know, that's affecting our children and our uh, parents that are out there funding higher education uh, at this point. And the children are going further and further debt. So the idea was let's control our spending right now. All the businesses, all the industries 
have been out there, have gone through recessions, have had to downsize, have had to control their spending. Education should have to meet the same thing. But they seem to get, it comes to them later in the cycle. And so they're going through that right now. I was very pleased that they took uh, basically a freeze this year. Uh, and uh, they're going to increase tuition uh, and keep it, I think, within 3%. That's a, that's a great goal for them to do. And then we can uh, try and grow out of it as the economy of Pennsylvania grows. But it then goes back to we've got to deal with the pensions. One of the other issues you're facing is infrastructure and having to repair roads, bridges in Pennsylvania. You signed uh, Grover Norquist, Norquist's no-tax no pledge. Um, to fund these infrastructure projects, you've proposed removing a cap on the wholesale gasoline tax over five years and a two-cent reduction in the gas tax paid by motorists at the pump over two years. Can you make the necessary repairs without violating that pledge? Well, I, I made the pledge really to the people of Pennsylvania that I wasn't going to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, we are reducing that gas tax at the pump by, by two cents, and uh, most of you in this room and watching probably understand that uh, the gas tax at the pump really is not getting the revenue that it used to get because of the fuel efficiency of cars. If you go to the gas pump and uh, when you were buying gas and you got 20 miles to the gallon, now you're getting 30 miles to the gallon, you're not going as often. And so the revenues were, were dropping off. At the same time, though, somewhere uh, back in the early uh, um, 1980s, 1990s, somewhere there, I forget, we put a cap on wholesale price of gas. Uh, and that was at $1.25. Well, the wholesale price of gas now is clearly over $3. We're not getting that additional money at this point in time, and we have suggested that we need to just take the cap off. Think about it more in terms of free market. You know, uh, the industry, the wholesalers have had a pretty good uh, deal having that cap on there, and they're selling it at a much higher price, but they're only paying tax to a certain point. We take that off, we're going to see considerable additional revenue. Um, so our bill brings in, I think, $1.8 billion over, over five years. And we're not rushing to bring in a lot in the beginning because it takes a while to get up to speed with the design, uh, the build and design of ideas of where, of where you can go, uh, and looking for a longer-term growth. Do you feel uh, constrained by years. having signed that pledge? No. I mean, a lot of people say, I, can't, I couldn't have signed that pledge and did what I did. Well, you know, this is what we're doing. Okay, I'm still keeping my promise. We're not raising taxes. We're taking a, a false cap off, uh, and it will generate more revenue. But, you know, that's how I'm looking at it. And somebody wants to argue me, well, they're going to argue with me. But we're going to bring that revenue in. The Senate, Senator Rafferty from the Philadelphia region, uh, has introduced a bill that is more aggressive and has a lot more in fees. And that's his starting point. Again, going back to the legislature. Um, it is sort of like negotiating. I've come in at one point. They've come in at another point. The House has a different perspective. All these pieces of legislation have um, different interests, different uh, supporters. We include the um, legislation to take us out of the liquor and wine business. Um, include the pension issue. Uh, they're all moving pieces of a puzzle that you know, I believe will be solved with the budget by June 30th. All right, well, let's turn to health care, because earlier this month you met with Health and Human Sec Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius about whether or not Pennsylvania would uh, take the Medicaid expansion under the President's Affordable Care Act. Are you any closer to making that decision? Um, I have more information. I wouldn't say that we're any closer uh, at, at this period of time. First off, I, I, I know that I believe in this, and I think many of the governors of the states believe in we want to provide uh, quality, affordable health care uh, to the people of our states. I want to do it for Pennsylvania. But we have to show that it is a sustainable um, and that the taxpayers, uh, frankly, can afford it. I took a look at Pennsylvania and what we pay in Medicaid. We're the second highest state per capita in the country when it comes to Medicaid payments. Uh, we're at an average of about 7,400. Uh, surprisingly to me, and maybe to many of you, uh, Missouri was number one. Uh, some of the bigger states were, and the average in the country is between 4,400 and 5,400. And one of the reasons we're so high <coughs> is that over the years, not only do we have the mandatory payments that you have to include in uh, uh, Medicaid, but we had opted in to many of the uh, optional programs, and that raised our costs. 
right now in Pennsylvania, one in six people are on Medicaid. If we were to accept the expansion, it will be one in four people are on Medicaid. And I have to see how that is sustainable, not just through my term and hopefully terms as governor, but for the next few governors thereafter, well, how when, do we continue to afford that? When do you think you'll... We continue to have questions of uh, HHS. Um, yeah, we, we have a number of uh, aspects that we have been talking with them. Uh, and whenever we have all the information, we'll make a decision. Do you feel any sort of <coughs> political pressure? You're a Republican governor surrounded by other Republican governors from Chris Christie in New Jersey to John Kasich in Ohio <coughs> who, have, who have taken it. Well, but every state is different. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, well, I talked to uh, Chris uh, when he took it, and he said it was only 100,000 more people or something like that to him. Uh, affordable. For us, I hear anywhere between 600 and 800,000 more people. Considerably more money that we would have to invest. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing that I'm looking at is the history of federal government continuing to keep their promises. Um, one of the biggest problems in education is the um, federal government not keeping its promise to fund special education at about 48, 49 percent, going down to 17 percent. Right now, this administration is saying we'll cover the next three years and then it'll go to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. well, what happens if it goes to 80, to 60, to 50? Where is Pennsylvania going to get it? And there's only one place to get it, and that's through um, you know, tax increases on the people of Pennsylvania and on the businesses of Pennsylvania. One of the reasons I'm finding to keep our taxes level right now is to increase um, the business investment in Pennsylvania and business growth in Pennsylvania. We're starting to see it. Uh, additional taxes right now would not be in the best interest of Pennsylvania. All right. Well, let's turn to energy. You have said that you want Pennsylvania to be the Texas of the natural gas boom. Yes, I have. How? I actually How? Want to, well, we, we, we are becoming that because of the natural gas fields that we have with the, the term Marcellus is the, the number one, but there's three other layers, uh, the Utica being next, Devonian in the third, and I forget what the fourth one is um, at the moment. Uh, if you measure it in BTUs, our gas fields, uh, our, our coal fields, uh, our energy in, in Pennsylvania, we're the second largest energy field in the world. We're the fifth largest energy producer in the United States right now in climbing. Our um, electricity prices continue to go down, making us very attractive to businesses uh, from other states and from other countries to come to Pennsylvania. Uh, so we are doing everything we can to develop our uh, energy industry in Pennsylvania, uh, including you and I talked about backstage, uh, working with Shell to help create the mm -hmm. ethylene cracker uh, facility in western Pennsylvania. I want to get to that in a second, but I also want to ask you about the impact fee, because uh, I believe you've said it's brought in more than $400 million right. in its first right. two years, but 2012 brought in less than 2011. So how can you be getting more for the state, more in revenues uh, out of this? Well. First off, the biggest complaint was I didn't put a severance tax, or the legislature in my direction didn't put a severance tax on, and other states, including Texas, do. Well, we have to compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Texas doesn't have a corporate net income tax. Pennsylvania does. Texas <coughs> doesn't have a personal income tax. Um, Pennsylvania does. These industries have been paying. They've been paying uh, the natural gas industry since 2009, I think, have paid over $1.6 billion dollars in taxes to Pennsylvania. This would have been an additional tax on top. And if you looked at Texas, they actually uh, suspended their severance tax for quite a while. Um, what we have done is created an impact fee so that 67% of the, 63%, uh, excuse me, of a fee on the drilling for a 10 year period goes back to the communities, it goes to Harrisburg, it goes right back to the communities. <coughs> It doesn't become part of the general fund budget, mm -hmm. which leaders, if money goes into the general fund budget, it doesn't necessarily go back to where it may be needed in a community. It goes to other projects. So we, we have addressed that. The money has gone down a little bit this year. Mm -hmm. Those numbers aren't final, but it's because drilling went down for a while because of the price of natural gas went down. As the price of natural gas goes back up, we see drilling starting to come back up. And in fact, this year, uh, this quarter that just completed, we're ahead of last year. Give us a sense on a micro level <coughs> how you've seen fracking really help 
communities you know, with, with the impact fee to, to the specifics that you were just alluding well, to. We'll and then on a bigger picture, the Shell plant, how that's going to help the state's overall economy. On a micro level, one of the um, smaller towns in um, Bradford County, Pennsylvania, has reduced uh, their property tax by 50% because of the money that was returned to them mm -hmm. through this process. That's, uh, that's about as close as you can bring it to the, to the micro community. The money can be used by the counties and by the municipalities to fix their roads, can go into their schools, they can go into their criminal court system, their, their, or actually their court system, and go into a number of different uses, fire and safety uh, and everything. So it, it has really helped those communities. With the ethylene cracker facility that um, Shell was taking a look at building in western Pennsylvania, uh, it has the potential, um, first off, for jobs in the construction process, 10,000 construction jobs for five years. To western Pennsylvania, that's going to be a huge employer. Uh, and then thereafter, to operate um, 500 jobs. But more importantly, the plastics industry will be looking to come to Pennsylvania and build along the rivers where the steel mills used to be, because that ethylene is used to create plastic, polypropylene. We won't be shipping that uh, natural gas out, or, or excuse me, we won't be importing that natural gas from other countries. We'll be saving, we're doing it here, saving us considerable money, but reindustrializing Western Pennsylvania. So when you look at the, the manufacturing loss that you're trying to rebuild from, this is this, this is a huge. I mean, it's going to take three, four, five years mm -hmm. to get there, but it's tremendous potential for Pennsylvania. All right, Governor, thank you. And Peter, I think we've got a couple questions. questions. <coughs> uh, good, Governor. Uh, this has been sent in. As a matter of solvency, how will working for 20 years as a policeman or fireman and then retiring at, say, age 42, receiving a guaranteed pension, nearly 100% of your salary that automatically increases 1% to 3% annually for 30 years, ever work? This is unheard of in the private sector, and our police and firemen pension such a political third rail that you won't even be able to address this question. <laughs> Put you on the spot, right? Wow. Now. You want to repeat that? that? No, um, it, it, it is, it's not just the police and, and firemen, though. It is um, the legislators, the, the court system, the, the teachers. The, you know, we have 500 school districts in Pennsylvania. It's all the teachers that are, that are part of the system. And that's why, uh, over the long haul, we have a long way to go in this pension system. But the law made a commitment to that, and, and we have to uh, continue with that. One of the aspects that we are doing, though, is saying that new employees have to go to a 401, actually it's a 401A style system. And there's great uh, reticent, actually opposition to that uh, coming out of the State Education Association. I'm gonna stick one, in, uh, one more in here. Do you worry about the Pennsylvania workforce's ability to capitalize on cheaper energy prices given the aging workforce? Do you have the workforce to capture the manufacturing opportunities or will you largely be an energy exporter? Um, I, no, I don't worry about having that workforce there because we're already starting to address the, the workforce issue. Um, I had a workforce investment commission. I also had a post-secondary education commission making recommendations. We're working with the schools uh, with K through 12, particularly uh, high school, getting more people over into the trades. Uh, we're also working with the community colleges and the state system colleges to create more technical degrees for people to be able to work in the fields, work on the uh, on the platforms, work in the, uh, the factories, uh, the, the ethylene cracker facility, and so forth. So we're in that process right now, so I, I think that we will have the workforce there. We do know, and this is a problem in the entire country, that in the trades, carpenters, plumbers, and so forth, 25% um, of the people in the trade system are 55 or older. So if you're talking to a young person, they don't necessarily have to go to college. You know, the average, I mean, they can get a trade and they're going to do better than many of the people graduating from college when it comes to you know, their salary. We have several more questions, Governor, but uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up so that we can make room for our next panel and keep ourselves on schedule here. But thank you for the time. And, thank Juliana, you. thank you as well. To the end, thank you. And with that, our thanks to the Governor of Pennsylvania. We're going to start or bring our next panel up here, my colleague Bob Light, the Director of Research at Bloomberg Government and ask him to step here on stage. I'm going to introduce the panelists for our next segment, which is Rethinking the Business Model, Public Debt and the Private Sector. A lot of discussion about that here in Washington and around the country. And ask our panelists to step up. First of all, we've got Senator Ben Cardin, the Democrat from Maryland. He's a member of the Finance Committee, been a 
player on a whole host of uh, policy issues here in Washington the last few years. Kurt Keene, he's the Chief Financial Officer at UPS, and Joseph Corbett, the Chief Financial Officer and Executive Vice President for the United States Postal Service. Of course, Postal Service and the future of the Postal Service has been a very hot topic as well here in Washington. I know we're going to get into that.